two baptisms, two of children that's been coming to our church, and I appreciate our children's ministry, and Hannah and all she does with our children, and uh, this is a direct result of, of, of our children's ministry, so I appreciate, appreciate our children's ministry so much, and the families of these Thomas and Kendall, we're so thankful that you're here today to celebrate this special day with them. Uh, we went and met in the office and talked about what baptism meant. And they've already asked Jesus to come into their heart and save, save them. They've already been forgiven of their sins. Uh, when they asked Jesus to forgive them, and he's living in their heart. Today is just a picture of what's already happened in their life. And so thank you for being here to celebrate that. We're going to let ladies go first today. So this is Kendall Shelton. <coughs> By your profession of faith, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ from baptism unto death, and raised to life.
next song that we're going to do. It's another Easter song. Um, and if you guys are regular um, attendees of the church, you're going to recognize this one from Christmas time. Uh, but it also has Easter lyrics. Um, the story behind this song, it's actually based on a secular song uh, that I guess is most famous to normal people from being on the Shrek soundtrack. Um, you might have heard it. But what I love about this is it's taking a secular song, a really depressing song, and it's adding Jesus to it um, and making it alive. And I think that's a picture of what happens to us um, whenever we come to Jesus. You know, we were dead, depressed. And now we're alive. Um, so listen to the words of this song.
I, I would get an intro to this next song, but actually, Regina says something about the song during the song, so I, I'll just let her know it. Thank you. 
Amen. Aren't you thankful for those promises? Amen. Those promises that God has made us that He is faithful. He's not slack concerning His promises. Let's, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You keep Your promises. We thank You for those promises that You've made to us. Father, You are so good. You're an awesome God. And Lord, we just celebrate this morning all that's going on in this place. Lord, from the baptisms, from the time of worship, Lord, to declaring what you did on Calvary's cross, Father, and declaring that you rose again, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us eternal life. Lord, we pray now as we get into your words that you would just speak to us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And amen. amen. Well, you want to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Galatians is where we are going to be. Um, children's Church is stepping out, I believe. Uh, so if you got a child who'd like to go to Children's Church, you can go to the back door right there and hit them down with the Children's Church workers this morning. Otherwise, you can just stay where you are. But appreciate you being here today. Galatians 4 is where we're going to be. We'll be back in Genesis just a little bit this morning as well. We've been going through a series called Grow. And we're looking at, as a church and as Christians, uh, what the Bible says about how we are to grow in our walk with Christ. How we are to grow in our faith. And we've been going every week through a different chapter of Galatians, beginning, I guess, four weeks ago now, with Galatians chapter 1. Last week, we looked at Galatians chapter 3 with the message, Faith or Works. Today's message is a follow-up to that. Today's message is Trust or Doubt. And we have seen over the past few weeks as Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, he is really writing to them to be aware of a false teaching that is coming to the church. This false teaching of a, a works-based salvation that in addition to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, these in Galatia were being taught that you need to, need to also follow the Jewish law to truly be saved. And, and so Paul is writing and warning about that. And so again, he's continuing to hear in Galatians 4, talking about that. But God's led my heart to a, a different thought from Galatians 4 that I want to share with you. And it's this. As we go back and think about what we've talked about in the book of Galatians, if we are living by the true gospel, which Galatians 1 taught us to do. If we're a real deal Christian, not a hypocrite, which Galatians 2 taught us to be. If we know that we are saved by faith, and not by works, which is what Galatians 3 taught us, then are we applying that faith which saved us to our lives, or are we living in doubt that the Word of God is true? So this morning, let's pray, and let's ask God to show us, to speak to our hearts, to reveal to us any area of our life where we may need to grow in our faith in Him. So let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, as we look into Your Word now, as we get into Galatians 4, I ask You as always to get me out of the way. Lord, we got a tremendous crowd this morning. <clears throat> but nobody is here to hear Scott helping you speak. It wouldn't be worth the time. But we are here to hear You, Father. That's who we desire to hear. So you get me, my thoughts, my mouth out of the way. I'm just your instrument, Lord. You speak through me now. Lord, I pray that if anybody in this place is doubting more than they are trusting, that your Holy Spirit would convict them of that today. And Lord, may somebody be saved today as Kendall and Thomas were. Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So the Constitution of the United States was written and it was completed and it was signed on September 17, 1787. And it was officially becoming, it officially became the law of our land when it was ratified on June 21, 1788. Now there was a lot of debate, a lot of discussion in the Constitutional Convention as these men uh, talked about what the law of our land would be. And the one thing, one of the things that they debated about a lot was the issue of slavery. Uh, of course, there were those who wanted slavery and believed slavery in the country should end, and there were those who counted on it for their financial gain. So no decision 
was made when our Constitution was written about slavery. There was nothing in the Constitution about slavery, about ending the slave trade. It wasn't until after the Civil War in 1865 when Congress passed the 13th Amendment that slavery was ended in the United States. A year later, in 1866, the 14th Amendment was added to our Constitution. It made all former slaves citizens of the United States. So they went from slave to free men. And then four years later, in 1870, the 15th Amendment was added to our Constitution, which gave African American men the right to vote in our country. So in just five years, between 1865 to 1870, a people went from slaves to citizens to having the opportunity to elect their leaders. Now there was obviously far more work that needed to be done, but it was an amazing positive change that happened in just five years with three amendments. Now if you're a Christian this morning, there was even a greater change that happened in your life and my life, and it happened even more quickly. As a matter of fact, the instant you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as the sinless Son of God who died on the cross of Calvary and rose again, just like Thomas and Kendall did, when you made that decision, you instantly went from slave to child to heir of God, which is pretty amazing. And there's an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along this morning. I believe it will be beneficial to you. We're looking here this morning at Galatians 4, and what we find in the first seven verses is that when we chose Jesus as our Savior, we went from slave to child to heir. Let's read Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And Paul writes, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. And here it is. Therefore, you are no longer slaves, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, praise his name to God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hey, let's never forget where we came from. Each and every one of us in this place today, we were born captive. We were born as slaves, as verse 3 says, under the elements of this world. Verse 3 says, even so when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of this world. What does that mean? That means we were slave to sin. The law of God, those ten commandments that were given that none of us could ever keep, that none of us could ever measure up to, reminds each and every one of us that we are all sinners. God's Word tells us that all have sinned. We've fallen short of the benchmark. We've sinned. And we are born with a sin nature. It's natural in the flesh for us to sin. You have to teach your child the truth, to tell the truth, rather. You don't have to teach your child. I hope you didn't ever teach your child to tell a lie. They learned that naturally, didn't they? Because see, it's, it's natural. We're born in the flesh with a sin nature. Your child knows how to lie without anybody ever teaching them to lie. That's because we're all born with a sin nature. So we have to teach our children to tell the truth. And Paul reminds us of this in verse 3. We are slaves to sin. The fact that we all have sinned is the truth. And we can't escape being captive to that. But praise the Lord because He loves you and I so much. Verse 4 and 5 here in Galatians 4 tell us what the Lord did to free us from slavery to sin. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. When the fullness of time had come, it says, that means... That means when it was in God's perfect timing that God so loved the world that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman, born of Mary, and His Son born under the law. He was a Jew. He was raised in a Jewish home that followed the Jewish law. And in verse 5 tells us the reason Jesus came, to redeem those 
who were under the law. In other words, those who were slaves to sin. The law teaches us that we are sin sinners. The law teaches us that we have sinned. And so we are going to be redeemed by Jesus Christ from being under the law because we were slaves to that sin. So Jesus set us free from the bondage of sin. Here's how he did it, church. This is something to get excited about this morning. Jesus took all of your sin and all of my sin upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And he left that sin nailed to Calvary's cross. And he died on the cross. And he shed his blood because the Bible says without the shedding of blood there could be no forgiveness of sin. So Jesus shed his blood. He paid the price that we should have paid. The Bible says the wages of sin is dead. And Jesus died in our place. Can I get a thank you, Jesus, today? Well, we need to understand that without Jesus dying on the cross to pay the price for our sin, that you and I would still be responsible for paying the price for our sin, which is death. Death and eternal separation from God in a place called hell had Jesus not died on the cross. So church reader, be careful not to get so comfortably numb to the fact of what Jesus has done for us that we forget to praise him yeah. like we should have been. Yeah. So Fairfield, I pray we give the Lord some praise today, yeah. amen, as we already have. Yeah. But you know what gets even better? That's good enough. We've been redeemed. We're no longer slaves to sin because Jesus took that sin upon himself. But it gets even better because verse 5 didn't end there. He who redeemed us who were under the law why? Let's read on. That we might receive the adoption as sons. <laughs> so that you and I could be called children of God. Amen? Amen. We could be called children of God. 1 John 3, 1 says it this way. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version. See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us. That we would be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. What an amazing love God has for us. That we might be called the children of God. And you know what? We didn't earn that right by our own goodness. But rather we are children of God because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Turn to your neighbor this morning on your right side. And tell him, hey, I'm a child of God. Turn to your neighbor on your left side and tell him. Oh, come on. We need a little more excited. Man. Somebody shout, I'm a child of God. If you can't shout that this morning, if you can't tell somebody that, John 1.12 tells us how we can become children of God. Listen closely. John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. You want to be a child of God, you've got to receive Jesus. You've got to believe in his name. You just need to believe and receive. Believe in the name of Jesus that he was the Son of God who died for his sin and rose again and received him into your heart and your life. I want to have a time of invitation if you'd like to do that at the end of the service, but you've got to wait. Hey, if you need to come down the aisle and you need to get saved, we'll stop what we're doing and we'll pray and we'll celebrate your salvation right now. So don't you feel like you've got to wait? If you're under conviction that you need Jesus in your heart today, well, you come on down anytime you want to. That's the most important thing that can happen today. Amen. Hey, we've been set free from our slavery to sin. We've been redeemed. We've become children of God. That's good, isn't it? That's good. Oh, but it gets even better. It didn't stop there. Let's read on to verses 6 and 7. Paul writes, and because you are sons, because you're children of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, we can look, we can look at our Heavenly Father, we can cry out to him, Abba, it's like, Daddy, we can cry out to him, Daddy. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but you are a son, and if you are a son, then you are an heir to God through Christ. You know, went from slave to child to heir to God. And heir gets an inheritance, amen? You have an inheritance coming your way if you're a child of God. What will you inherit? Well, it's out of this world. <laughs> it's out of this world. A great song says it this way. There's a beautiful city just beyond the starry sky. We shall inherit some glad day. There where Christ will ever be for all eternity, we shall inherit some glad day. We'll walk on streets of gold down heaven's avenue. Talk with James and John, all things will be new. We'll shake the master's hand, and oh, won't it be grand, we shall inherit 
some glad day. One day soon he shall return, and we'll behold his face. We shall inherit some glad day. He'll show me to my mansion that he said he would prepare. We shall inherit some glad day. We inherit eternal life, amen? What a blessing it is to know Jesus. What a blessing it is for Kendall and Thomas this morning and their family to know that because of their faith in Jesus, one day they're going to inherit a heavenly home for all of eternity. And that's for all of God's children. But you know, as we travel down this road of life, the enemy likes to cause us to stumble, doesn't he? And when that happens, uh, we can start doubting these promises that we're talking about. There's promises that Regina sang about. Our faith can weaken. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves out of church. Because we don't feel worthy anymore. Well, let me tell you, nobody here, especially including me, is worthy. None of us are worthy. And for some, this doubt that faith in Jesus is enough to save them... Well, some try to cause God to love them more by becoming slaves to the law once again. If I don't do this and this, then God won't love me anymore and won't let me into heaven. Oh, child of God, listen to me this morning. Don't return to slavery. Don't return to slavery. Look at verses 8 through 11. But then indeed, when you did not know God... You serve those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, and I like this, or rather you are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. So specifically, these that Paul are writing to in Galatia uh, have, as he says, turned back to the weak and beggarly elements that were keeping them in bondage to begin with. But what things are these that he's talking about? Well, he tells us in verse 10. He says, you observe, you observe the days, you observe the months, you observe the seasons and the years. In other words, they've gone back to that belief of doubting that their faith in Jesus was enough to save them. So they're trying to keep all these Jewish laws, these Jewish traditions of feasts and that came around every day and month and year. They're trying to keep the Jewish law in addition to their faith to be saved. Now, let's bring it to today. And we have to ask ourselves this. In addition to faith in Jesus Christ, are we trying to do good works to make God love us and accept us? Or are we doing good works in our life because we love the Lord? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Are we living in trust or doubt? Now there's no doubt that as Christians, we need to do our best to live for the Lord by doing His Word. James 1.22 tells us, be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. So if we've truly received and believed in Jesus and understand what it took for Him to redeem us on Calvary's cross, then we ought to, Christians, have a desire to live for Him and to please the Lord with our life. Why do we get up early on a Sunday morning and come to church? Because He died for us. Why do we surrender our life to Him? Because He died for us. And oh, He didn't die for us because, I was, because we were good enough or because we were worthy. But He died for us because He loves us. And he knew that we were sinners who needed a Savior. We didn't do anything to make God love us. And we can't do anything to make him not love us. We don't earn God's love by doing good works. We serve him because we love him. But listen to this. Even if you reject Jesus, even if you want to reject Jesus, God still loves you. Hmm. That's hard to take in, but it's true. Yep. You can't get God to stop loving you. Luke 13, 34 is a picture of this. It's Jesus grieving over Jerusalem who would not accept him as the Messiah. He loved Jerusalem. He says, I want you to turn to me, but you won't. Uh, Luke 13, 34, Jesus says, 
Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as the hand gathers your fruit under her wings, but you were not willing. God's love for you is never ending. He's never going to stop loving you, even if you reject him. The eternal question is this, the one that counts for all of eternity. Do you trust him or do you doubt him? Do you trust that Jesus was son of God or do you have any doubts about that? Will you trust that just as the Bible says, faith in Jesus Christ is the son of God, a simple life-changing belief that you're a sinner and he is your savior, will you trust God's word in this today? Or are you going to return to slavery, trying to earn your way to heaven, trying to be good enough, trying to live perfectly under the law? Don't doubt. Trust. Don't doubt. Trust. Here's why. Look at verses 21 through 31 in Galatians 4. You are a child of the promise. You're a child of the promise. Now, I'm going to tell you before we read these 10 verses here, it gets kind of deep, and I'm going to go and explain it. So if you get a little lost, in verses 21 through 31, just hang on. We'll dig in and, and see what, what, what is meant by these verses. Galatians 4, 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it's written, Rejoice, O barren ye who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So it's a little confusing there. So it's easy to get lost in this analogy that Paul is making here between being free in Christ and being held bondage to, to sin. Let me simplify it with some thoughts here. Paul uses this promise of a child that God made to Abraham and Sarah and their doubt that it was actually going to happen as an example of those who live by faith and those who live in doubt of God's word. It's as simple as that. God told Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child. You're going to have a child. But it was a long time. Many, many years later, they began to doubt that they would ever have a child. So Sarah told Abraham, I'm not going to have a child, so I want you to sleep with my slave, with my servant, Hagar. And sure enough, he did, and Hagar became pregnant and gave birth to a child named Ishmael. And this represents the doubt of God's promise and trying to do things on our own. So let's look at this example in depth as we finish up this morning. And the first thing we see here, I want you to turn back to the book of Genesis with me now. Genesis chapter 15. I want you to see this with your own eyes. Genesis chapter 15. Why are we called the child of promise here in Galatians 4? Genesis chapter 15. We're going to look first here at verses 2 through 5. And what we're going to see here is that God made the promise. This is the promise we read here in verse 4 especially that God made to Abraham and Sarah. So Genesis 15, verses 2 through 5. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. Here's the promise. But you, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. In other words, you and Sarah are going to have a child, your own flesh and blood. Verse 5. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. 
There's the promise. God made a promise to Abraham. You're going to have a child. Your own flesh and blood. You and Sarah. And Abraham did well at first. Look at the next verse. Verse 6 there. Abraham believed it. Abraham believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the promise that God made to him. Okay, God. You said it. I believe it. He made the correct first decision. He trusted God's promise. He believed the word of the Lord. That's faith. That's where you and I should be living. Faith that Jesus took us from slave to child to heir. And that one day when this life is over, we're going to have that promise of eternal life in heaven. And so we live in that faith daily, trusting the word of God. Letting that faith guide us as we go through this life living for the Lord. But even though Abraham made this correct decision at first, when that promise seemed too difficult, here's what happened. Sarah and Abraham later doubted it. Sarah and Abraham later doubted it. Turn on over now to Genesis 16. Look at the first five verses here in Genesis 16. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to, husband, to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And Sarah said, Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. So the doubt of God's promise crept in, and it messed things up so bad. What you had was a promise of God. Now you've got an illegitimate baby. You've got a jealous wife. An angry mistress. We're really good at messing up God's perfect promises, aren't we? He has a plan for our life. And when we begin to doubt, we mess things up. And look at the danger of doubting. Look at the pain it causes here. Look at the problems that it created. Did you notice in verse 5 that Sarah told, even though Sarah told Abraham to sleep with, sleep with Hagar, she blames Abraham for the problem? It's just like a woman, isn't it? <laughs> but listen, who did God make the promise to? Abraham. Abraham heard the word of God himself. He ought to know better. He ought to know better. God told him, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. He should have known better. <clears throat> Sometimes we should have known better. I can look back at my life and I can see times where I should have known better. And I'm sure you can too. But here's the good news, folks. Even though Abraham and Sarah messed up God's plan, and even though we mess up God's plan, plan at times, God still kept the promise. Look over now in Genesis 21. God kept the promise. Genesis 21, verses 1 through 6. Sarah and Abraham, they messed it up. God said, I'm going to give you a child, but they tried to do it on their own. With another way, other than God's way, but... Even though they messed up, God still kept the promise. Genesis 21, the first six verses. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. You know that word promise over and over again. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him and as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. A Christian, listen, even if it takes 100 years. God's going to keep His promise. Yes. Even if it takes 100 years, God is going to keep that promise. Yes, so can I tell you this morning, keep the faith. Yes. Keep the faith. Don't try
try to make a way on your own. Keep the faith even when things seem impossible. Keep the faith. Even when the enemy puts doubts in your mind, keep the faith. Trust the Lord. God's word is true. His promises are sure. His way is better than our way. Trust Him. You see, Isaac was God's plan. Isaac was God's plan. Wouldn't things have been so much easier if Abraham and Sarah had just trusted God? He promised a son, and he kept his promise. Isaac was God's plan for their life. But they tried to do things on their own. And so we see that Ishmael was man's interference. Ishmael was man's interference in God's promise. Hagar and Ishmael. The problem wasn't their fault. She was a slave. She did what her master told her to do. Ishmael was the result of Abraham and Sarah doubting God's word. Now it's interesting to note that God still cared for Hagar and God still cared for Ishmael. It wasn't their fault. You can read over in Genesis 21 and if you will look there with me in verses 17 through 21 after Abraham and Sarah had sent Hagar and Ishmael away because they were jealous. There said, this little boy is not going to have any of my Isaac's inheritance. They'd sent him away. And here's what happened in 17 through 21 in, verse Gen in Genesis 21. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God's heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. So it's interesting to know that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't Hagar's mistake. It wasn't Ishmael's fault. This happened to them. And God still watched after him. God still loved them. God loves, God loves us. God loves us. Despite our mistakes, God loves us. Let's go back to Galatians 4 now with me, if you would, please. Galatians 4, because this long analogy that's a little bit confusing that we just read from Galatians 4, there's a simple fact from it that God wants us to learn from this, this analogy he makes with, uh, Her uh, with uh, Hagar and, and Ishmael. And it's this. Look back in Galatians 4 and verse 24. What we find is this simple fact here is that doubting God produces bondage. Doubting God produces bondage. Verse 24, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. This one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. This, this way that Abraham and Sarah tried to do their own thing without believing God's promise, when they begin to doubt God's promise, and they tried to do it their own way with Hagar and, and then Ishmael. It represents the bondage we put ourselves in when we doubt God. When we live in doubt of His promises, rather than living in faith, we've returned to slavery. We put ourselves back in bondage. We're in bondage to worrying if we're good enough for heaven. And so we'll try to start doing things our way and try to earn our way to heaven and we'll interfere with God's perfect plan as Abraham and Sarah did. And we'll not enjoy the freedom that is found only in trusting God. John 8, 36 tells us that if we are set free by Jesus, then we are totally, indeed, free. If we're set free by Jesus, see, freedom comes with faith. Doubt produces bondage. But freedom comes with faith in God. It comes with trusting. And that's the final thought this morning. Trusting God produces blessing. Where doubting God produces bondage, if we'll simply trust Him, it produces blessings. And here's that verse that tells us we're children of promise. Verse 28 in Galatians 4. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Isaac was a child of promise. God promised Abraham a son, and that promise was fulfilled in Isaac. God promised us in Isaiah 9, 6. 
that a son would be born, a savior would be given. God promises us redemption and forgiveness through that son. And the promise was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, his son. And so the question I will leave you with today is this. What are you going to do with that promise of redemption? What are you going to do with that promise of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life? Will you do like Sarah and Abraham? Will you doubt God's promises are true? Or would you do like Carter and Kendall did? And would you believe and trust it? Would you believe and trust it and be saved? You see, the choice is yours. But I'm here to tell you that you can be a child of promise today. If you will trust and not doubt. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment. Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you that you never break a promise to us. That your word is sure and it is true. And Father, as in the flesh, sometimes we let those doubts creep in. We try to do things our way instead of trusting your perfect plan. Forgive us for that, Lord. Lord, I pray now, if there's anybody in this place who's been doubting, doubting that you could love them, doubting that their faith was good enough to save them, that through your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would call them to repentance from that today, Lord, that they would trust and no longer doubt, that they would trust in what your son Jesus did, that they might be saved today. Help us all, Father, Trust. Trust your word that it is true. Trust your promises that they are sure. And when the enemy wants to put doubt in our minds, may our minds return to you and your word. Help us not try to do things our way, but rely totally on you, Father. Trust in your way and your word. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. In a crowd this size this morning, there's probably one or more people here that have never made that decision to trust Jesus as the Lord and Savior. You've seen in examples we began the service that this childlike faith that Jesus talks about is all it takes. Jesus, as a matter of fact, Jesus said that unless you become like one of these. Unless, in other words, unless you have a faith like a child has, you can't get to heaven. So this morning, would you let Kendall and Thomas be an example to you of the faith that it takes to receive that promise of eternal life? And this morning, if you've never made a decision to trust Jesus as your Savior, you're going to have that opportunity right now. I'm going to say a simple prayer. And if you'd like to ask Jesus to come into your heart, forgive you of your sin, and save you today, you just repeat after me in your heart. You mean what you are praying today. You just repeat after me now. So you need to make that decision. Pray, with, pray after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. And I need a Savior. I believe that your Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I believe that He was placed in a borrowed tomb, but that He rose again, conquering death and giving me the promise of eternal life. I believe He's coming back one day. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. And save me. 
I give my life to you. All heads bowed and all eyes closed still for just a moment. The Word of God says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you shall be saved. It's another promise of God that He doesn't break. That if you believe it, receive it, confess it, you will be saved. So who this morning believed it? Nobody looking around. Who this morning would raise your hand and say, I prayed just now for the first time, and I asked Jesus into my heart just now, and I want to confess that I'm saved. Anybody? I see a hand. Anybody else prayed that prayer this morning, and you know now that you received Jesus as your Savior, and heaven's going to be home one day. Anybody else pray that this morning? All right, then. Well, I'm going to ask you, to look up at me now. We're going to have this kind of invitation. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just make a public confession to this church by stepping and coming down the aisle and letting this body of believers here today know that this is your day of salvation. This is the day when you stopped doubting and you started trusting God. It's a big step. It's intimidating to come down in front of a crowd this size, I know. But if you raised your hand and you chose Jesus today, would you do that? Who knows who might follow you down this aisle and be saved also because you had the boldness to confess it today. Let's all stand. They say, if you chose Jesus today, you come on down this aisle. Come on let this church know that you were saved today. Save 
baptisms that we got to enjoy with Thomas Kendall today. What a blessing it has been to be here. Guests, we hope this is not your only time coming to be with us. We want you to come back and be with us every time you get a chance. I want to go over a few announcements here. Uh, we'll take long. I'll be respectful of your time. Uh, just a couple things coming up on our calendar. Um, or for our children, we've got coming up on April the 9th from 11 to 1 in a pavilion out here. An Easter egg hunt and cookout. I don't know which is better, find Easter eggs or eat hot dogs. I like both of them. But, uh, our kids are going to come and, uh, and enjoy an Easter egg hunt and cookout. If you would like to make donations of candy or plastic eggs, little fillable items that you can put inside the eggs, uh, or you give a cash donation if you'd like to do that. See, Ann Clark, you can raise your hand there and you can go see her and if you'd like to make a donation to that of any kind, uh, we'd appreciate that greatly. We finished up our book study the Wednesday night over at Davy Crockett Restaurant um, for uh, our I Will uh, book study. But we're not done. <laughs> We've got this week is designated as our mission project. So our second, our first mission project was a project within our church family or within the church. This one has to be outside the walls of the church. And so this week, uh, all of those participating in the book study are going to be doing something outside of the box and out of their comfort zone, reaching out to people in our community in some way with the love of Jesus Christ. And uh, it was supposed to be our last meeting at Baby Crockett this past week, but we voted that we're going to come back and have a sharing time of what God did this week. So in, in this week, this week there will not be any adult uh, study here at church. We're going to be out in the community and, and uh, with a mission project. But then in two weeks, we're going to have our final session at Navy Crockett as a sharing time about how God used this mission project for his glory. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, that'll be April 6th at 6.30 is the last time we'll meet there. Um, coming up on Easter, as Isaac said earlier, so on April, Sunday, April 10th, I believe it is, uh, we'll be taking our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We'll get those envelopes to you soon, and we'll place, you can just place that offering in the offering plate that Sunday morning. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering supports missions in North America, church plants, uh, places all over the place. All over the United States telling people about Jesus Christ, a great ministry. Another ministry opportunity we're investing in the church is the Isaiah 117 house. Can you Beth, would you like to say anything about that? Uh, we're basically just going to be taking up clothes, like new clothes, um, for kids. They have them there from newborn to 17 years old. And right now they're really in need of preteen and teenage size clothing. So you can either buy new clothes and bring them to me, or I've had a few people give me money and I'll go shop and get it to them or get gift cards that the employees at Isaiah 117 House can go shop for the kids for things that they need. So we're basically going to try to get some clothes together because this is a place where these kids go so they're not sitting in the DCS office between trying to get into a foster. That's right. So we'll be blessed with these foster children as they're between homes. And this Isaiah 117 house, uh, so often our testimony, the lady who started this, she'd go in and see, see where they were before, and they were sleeping on the floor, and, and dirty floor, dirty, didn't have clothes, um, because they're foster children. And so uh, this is a ministry, uh, it's a local ministry that she started, and uh, so we're going to be a blessing to these foster children. So you can read more about that in your bulletin. Uh, any other thing that I'm forget forgetting uh, this morning? Anything else we need to say, or anybody just have a word on your heart that you want to share? Yeah. Um, uh, the ladies' class downstairs are beginning a new study, and the study uh, deals with uh, end time events and what uh, scripture says about it. And uh, so I'd like to invite any of the ladies that want to just come on down and be with us. We're just starting it, it's great. So far, so good. Amen. Amen. And yeah, coming part of Sunday school at 2 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Is Thomas still in here? Thomas, can you come up here for just a minute? Because your mom and I talked about something that I forgot to do earlier. Uh, and then Kendall will get you up here in a minute too. But uh, Thomas and Mom Shanna said that when he's baptized this morning, he would also like to join our church. And I forgot to take a vote on our this morning. <laughs> Come up, and then Kendall, would you come up? 
Anybody from your family wants to come up and stand up here with you? Because what we want to do is come by and congratulate you all on your baptism today. And, and so as we are dismissed, uh, church, I hope you'll come by and, and uh, congratulate Kendall and congratulate Thomas on their baptism and uh, just tell them how proud you are of them for following the Lord and Lakers' baptism. Here comes, here comes little sister. She's cute. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, the invitation time is never over. I'm going to be at the back door, and, and if you'd like to receive Jesus in your heart, it's the, the, the opportunity is always available. You catch me at the back, and you say, I'd like to talk to you privately, preacher, and you and I can go in our office. We can take care of things back there if we need to, okay? Well, God bless you. Have a great day. Uh, come by and just congratulate uh, these guys on their baptism this morning. Anthony, would you just miss us in prayer, please? Well, thank the Lord for allowing us to be in your house this morning, Lord. Thank the Lord for uh, the blessings that you give us day in and day out, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these two young kids getting baptized, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for that, and we just hope we have many more to come, Lord. We know there's many sick and many downtrodden. We just ask you, Lord, to lay your hand upon them and touch them, and touch the ones that are here, that, uh, that we've all got secretly things that, uh, that's bothering us, Lord, but uh, you, know what, you know all about them. We just ask you, Lord, to uh, lay your hand upon all of us, Lord. Keep us safe. Uh, watch over us as we go out. Let us always be a light unto you, Lord, in this dark, dark world. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.